Hi there. If you've ever wondered how Neil Gaiman edits, today you're going to find out because I'm trying to edit like Neil Gaiman. The reason I decided to do an I tried editing like video is I watch a lot of Kate Cavano, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, I'm sorry, but she does a lot of I Try Writing Like videos, and so I kind of wanted to pay homage to her a little bit by doing an I Tried Editing Like video. So that's kind of where the inspiration came from, so I looked up a couple of different authors that I wanted to emulate for this editing video, specifically because I wanted to pick an author that A I knew of and B that I liked and I was able to find his stuff pretty easily. So now I'm going to talk about how Neil Gaiman edits. I found an article on lithub.com that talks about some contemporary writers and what they do as far as editing goes. The quote that I found from him was as follows, most short stories go through a couple of drafts and polish. I'll write a first draft, then if it wasn't typed, I will type it up, then I'll email it to friends and find out what didn't work or what puzzled them. I like Mike Ford, he was the sharpest of all of them, saved me from making a fool of myself half a dozen times. And then if I can, I'll put it away for a week or two, not look at it, try to forget about it, then take it out and read it as if I've never seen it before and had nothing to do with its creation. Things that are broken become very obvious suddenly. I'll go in and polish it up and possibly keep playing with it a little. It's on the computer. Everything's malleable until it's printed. I'll try to read it out loud the next time I do a reading in order to find out what I can about it, including places where I wrote, where what I wrote was not what I meant and I'll fix what I find and then I'll go on to the next thing. Personally, I think you can learn more from finishing things, from seeing them in print, wincing and then figuring out what you did wrong than you can ever do from eternally rewriting the same thing. But that's me, and I came from comics where I simply didn't have the liberty of rewriting a story until I was happy with it, because it needed to be out that month, so I needed to get it more or less right the first time. Once, I disliked a Sandman story on proofreading, on proofreading it so much that I asked if, I could be, if it could be pulled and buried, and I was told no it couldn't, which is why the world got to read the Emperor Norton story three Septembers into January. Although I no longer have any idea why I thought it was a bad story, and I'm pleased that Tom Pear ignored my yelps. For today's editing video, I'm focusing on just three things that I found. The main things out of this that I'm going to be focusing on are having a friend look at it. Friend? In this case, I'm having my mother look at it because that's just who I have available to me at the current point in time. I can't exactly go see my friends, and I don't know if they'll get it in time. So, I had her look through the first few pages or so. I'm going to use the things that really puzzled her or the things that she felt didn't really work and go through those first. Then after that, I'm going to read it out loud with the first round of changes. And then after that, I'm going to call it done because as he said, you don't want to edit it too many times. In preparation for this, I did let the story sit for a couple of weeks. So I am also taking his advice of letting it sit for a little bit as well. And we're going to see what the before and after looks like. I'm just focusing on the first two little scenes right now because I want to keep this not super long, although I have a feeling it's still probably going to end up being pretty long. So in the first chapter, um, as you have Gabriel sleeping, I think you need to introduce where he's at, uh, um, give a little bit more detail to the setting. Um, apparently Rose and he are in the same area, but it's hard to tell that at first. You don't see that till later on, so you might want to give a little bit more of an indication of that. Um, as um, they're sneaking to the greenhouse door, or Rose's, um, it, she later talks about um, her father using the word he, and I think you need to state that it's her father because it might confuse the reader. Um, instead of her pinching him, maybe she could, uh, to wake him up, maybe she could shove him harder instead. Um, it seems to be more suited to the relationship. 
And then the only other thing I really had was later on as you're introducing the setting and you talk about Rose relaxing a little, um, despite his misgivings, um, she could always count on him to come through when it mattered. You were talking about um, Gabriel, but you don't tell what his misgivings were about. So you might want to explain that a little bit more. Okay, so now that I've gotten my feedback, I'm going to just go through this and let you hear it before I do all of this editing. As Gabriel slept, flashes of Nightshade's memories cycled through his mind. The nymph's anger was palpable as Gabriel watched the river in the forest turn to a muddy brown and then soot black. They'll pay water for water and blood for blood, Nightshade said. Gabriel saw that the soot was coming from a factory in their town. Strange. He didn't remember them ever having a factory. Then he learned why. Nightshade had a match in his hand. He threw it at the factory and it went up in flames. Rose woke to the all too familiar thump of a fist slamming against the wood of her parents' front door. It was accompanied by the shatter of glass and spine chilling yell. No light streamed through the window of her bedroom. As the banging continued, her father shouted, I'm gonna get you for this. I'll beat you black and blue, you ungrateful wench. A shiver snaked its way up her spine at the slurred words. She crept out of bed and left her makeshift, sh makeshift shed of a bedroom, being careful not to wake up Gabriel. There was still a large hole where her front door used to be, a remnant of Nightshade and Belladonna's battle. As she tiptoed to the greenhouse door, she passed some scorch marks on the footpath and overturned earth where Gabriel had dug his heels in when attacking Nightshade. After sneaking to the greenhouse door, she fumbled with the latch until the door popped open she poked her head out to see what damage was he was causing this time. The glass from a broken beer bottle was scattered all over the grass. He swayed on his feet. He continued to bang on and tug at the door, but it wouldn't budge. Maybe her mother was ready to seek help after all, she'd lo after all if she'd locked him out. After several more minutes, he realized he wasn't getting in and ground his teeth together in frustration. He yelled, when I get back inside, I'll make you pay for this in blood. Then he stormed off. Rose poked her head back inside the greenhouse and guided the greenhouse door shut. She was careful to be silent so as not to attract her father's rage. She crept back to her room through the hole in the garden shed turned home. And when she reached Gabriel, who had been sleeping on the floor next to her bed, she bent down and gave his shoulder a light shake. Gabriel, wake up, she said. He stirred lightly but rolled over. Just a few more minutes, he mumbled. This time she pinched him. At that, he turned over and narrowed his eyes at Rose. What do you want this early? Rose sighed. Guilt clutched her stomach. Leaving her mother would be a death sentence with her father still in the picture. She wasn't happy about her mother's behavior towards her. She couldn't, but she couldn't leave her to be tortured by the monster who was supposedly her father. Rose had blamed Lila for staying with that sorry excuse for a man. She knew now Lila didn't have many choices. Financial independence wasn't exactly easy as a single woman in the early 1900s. With no living relatives aside from her daughter, who was an invalid until a few weeks ago. The silence stretched out, and she bit her thumbnail, knowing she wasn't going to like what she had to do next. She reached out to grab Gabriel's hand and looked up at him with pleading eyes. Will you help me get my mother out of here too? He thought about it for a moment, and then his easy smile cracked the silence. Of course I'll help you. But we'll do it later, after I've had some sleep. Rose relaxed a little. Despite his misgivings, she could always count on him to come through when it mattered. Rose smiled and kissed him on the forehead as he drifted back off to sleep. Now, she had to come up with a plan. Okay, so now I'm going to get down to the editing portion of this. I'm going to apply the changes from this to start, and then I'm going to do the reading out loud. I'm just going to do the first few pages, so we'll see how long this takes. Okay, so I managed to finish the first two pages 
for the two scenes that I wanted to revise. So now I'm going to read it out loud so you can hear what it sounds like after. And so I can get any ideas of what I want to change. After their battle with Nightshade, Gabriel fell asleep beside Rose in their makeshift bedroom. In her makeshift bedroom. They hadn't bothered to remove any remnants of the battle that had taken place taken place the night before. I'm going to add that. Nightshade's memories haunted him as he slept that night. I'm going to say haunted Gabriel instead. Flashes of Nightshade's memories cycled through his mind. The nymph stood before a muddy brown river as it turned soot black. In the background, Gabriel could see, I'm going to change from he to Gabriel. Gabriel could see a forest of flame and the sound of children screaming. Belladonna was trying to stoke the flame, but it only leapt higher. Do I have the right word here? Leapt? I'll have to check that later. Possible spelling mistake. Beside her, a nymph boy cried out, Please save him, Nightshade. You told me you'd save my friend. The tree was blackened from the roots to the treetops. From the root. From the roots to the treetop. From the root to the treetop. I think I was right the first time. From the root to the treetop. But still the flame raged, leaping from tree to tree, killing even more nymphs in its wake. The water in the river only stoked the flames. There was no saving the forest. Nightshade threw a glass bottle filled with muddied water to the ground. It shattered into tiny pieces. They'll pay, water for water and blood for blood. Nightshade stormed out of the forest towards a factory. The soot staining the river came. I'm going to change this. The soot staining the river came from a factory. I'm going to change that. It was the source of the tainted water. A factory in my hometown. Strange, Gabriel thought. I'm gonna, change, I, I'm gonna add in Gabriel thought because that wasn't here before. Or let's actually let's do this. Instead of he didn't remember, Gabriel didn't remember. Gabriel didn't remember them ever having a factory in town. Nightshade's eyes darkened as he approached the building. People rushed in and out of it as they headed to and from work. In his hand were two dangerous items: a discarded bottle of alcohol and a match. They'll be killed by the very things they discarded in my forest. If they weren't so selfish, they wouldn't need to suffer. Belladonna raced towards him. I'm going to say instead of race after him, because she's probably already there. Race towards him. Don't do it. Whatever they did, it doesn't justify mass murder. Nightshade sneered. If getting revenge for my people makes me evil, then it's a small price to pay. If you do this, then you will be my enemy. I'll make your life a waking nightmare. Nightshade smirked. He stared at Belladonna and threw the alcohol to the ground. I don't think I, or, oh, sorry. Nightshade smirked. He stared at Belladonna as he threw the alcohol to the ground and lit the match. I'd love to see you try. He threw the match at the factory. It went up in flames. Rose woke to the all too familiar thump of a fist slamming against the wood of her parents' front door. It was accompanied by the shatter of glass and a spine-chilling yell. I'm missing a word there. And a spine-chilling yell. No light streamed through the window of her bedroom. Next to her, Gabriel still slept soundly on the floor beside her bed. As the banging continued, her father shouted, I'm gonna get you for this. I'll beat you black and blue, you ungrateful wench. A shiver snaked its way up her spine slurred words. She crept out of bed and left her makeshift shed of a bedroom, being careful not to wake Gabriel. There was still a large hole where her front door used to be, a remnant of Nightshade and Belladonna's battle. As she tiptoed to the greenhouse door, she passed some scorch marks on the footpath and overturned earth where Gabriel had dug his heels in when attacking Nightshade. After sneaking to the greenhouse door, she fumbled with the latch until the door popped open. She poked her head out to see what damage he was causing this time. The glass from a broken beer bottle was scattered all over the grass. His father swayed on his feet. 
He continued to bang on and tug at the door, but it wouldn't budge. Maybe her mother was ready to seek help, after all, if she'd locked him out. After several more minutes, he realized he wasn't getting in and ground his teeth together in frustration. He yelled, When I get back inside, I'll make you pay for this in blood. Then he stormed off. Rose poked her back, poked her head back inside the greenhouse and guided the door shut. I'm going to take out the word greenhouse because that's repetitive. She was careful to be silent so as not to attract her father's rage. She crept back to her room through the hole in the garden shed, and when she reached Gabriel, who had been sleeping on the floor next to her bed, she bent down and gave his shoulder a light shake. Gabriel, wake up, she said. He stirred lightly, but rolled over. Just a few more minutes, he mumbled. She shoved him harder. At that, he turned over and narrowed his eye to Rose. What do you want this early? Rose sighed. Guilt clutched her stomach. Leaving her mother would be a death sentence with her father still in the picture. She wasn't happy about her mother's behavior towards her. She couldn't leave her to be tortured. Oh, that needs to be a period. Sorry. She couldn't leave her to be tortured by the monster who was supposedly her father. Rosa blamed Lila for staying with that sorry excuse for a man, period. She knew now Lila didn't have many choices. Financial independence wasn't exactly easy as a single woman in the early 1900s with no living relatives, aside from her daughter, who was an invalid until a few weeks ago. The silence stretched out, and she bit her thumbnail, knowing she wasn't going to like what she had to do next. I think this sentence with the fi starting with financial independence might need a little bit of tweaking, but we'll come back to that. The silence stretched out, and she bit her thumbnail, knowing she wasn't going to like what she had to do next. She reached out to grab Gabriel's hand and looked, him looked up at him with pleading eyes. Will you help me get my mother out of here, too? He thought about it for a moment, and then his easy smile cracked the silence. Of course I'll help you, but we'll do it later, after I've had some sleep. Rose relaxed a little. Despite the mystery still shrouding his past, and his often closed-off demeanor, she could always count on him to come through when it mattered. Rose smiled and kissed him on the forehead as he, as he drifted back off to sleep. Now she had to come up with a plan. So that's what it sounds like post-editing, as you can probably hear as I was reading it, I was changing some things here and there. So I think this is definitely where doing the reading out loud tends to come in handy. So I completely see why this would be helpful. I think it definitely reads better. I, of course, am still going to have it go through a line editor. But now you have an idea of how Neil Gaiman edits. And hopefully this was helpful for you. My overall take from this writing experiment was that definitely having someone look at it and give me feedback is really helpful. And also I noticed that I picked up on a lot more things when I was just going slower with my editing. I tend to go through really quickly and just think of like the edits that I get from the developmental editor. Reading it out loud after I've already done the edits instead of doing it you know, before I give it to the person that's going to give me feedback was really helpful because I ended up changing a lot after I gave it to someone. And I think it made the writing flow a lot nicer when I was reading it and going like, oh, okay, that sounds weird, or oh, that sentence is a little bit clunky. So I would definitely recommend using this. And I think I'm probably going to use this again. Well, that's all for me today. If you liked this video, go ahead and click that like button and subscribe to my channel. And let me know below what other videos you'd like to see for I Tried Editing Like. But that's all. Thanks. Bye. So now I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how Neil Gaiman edits. Double chin here.